This what you can have. Me the part to it. You're all very welcome. We're delighted uh, to have uh, today's speaker with us, Regina Sexton. I've been after Regina for quite a while now uh, to, to, to give this talk for us. Uh, Regina is a food and culinary historian, a food writer, uh, broadcaster and cook. She has published widely at academic and popular levels and is a member of the Food Safety Consultative Council, the Irish Food Writers Guild and a committee member of the Agricultural History Society of Ireland. She is program manager of the MA in food studies and Irish food ways offered here at UCC. I think the first of its kind, Regina, uh, in an Irish university, uh, dedicated entirely to a focus on Irish foods and culinary culture. So, having published a, a very, very interesting article with us in Beskna in the last edition of Beskna, I've been pursuing Regina for since then to come in and chat with us about uh, the very interesting cooking utensil that was used in former times for baking bread, uh, the crown the raw, uh, and all related matters. So, can the hill and will it? I'm going to show you to vor with Regina Sexton, Le Kint Dartedel, toasting the oat cake, an exploration of the material and culinary culture of the oat cake in Irish vernacular tradition. Uh, good now, good. Kieran, thank you, Kieran, and Emma, for organising uh, the event today. I, I, I need to stay in one place now, don't I? Well, that would be a challenge. Um, <laughs> but um, thanks very much for the invite to come and speak to you about the hardening stands, where we see all the different names down the road. Um, so I'm very happy to be here. Um, as Kieran said, this was um, a piece of research that's been kind of ongoing for ages, and I'll show you now in a minute. Um, but then it all came together, it kind of coalesced, came together uh, for the publication uh, in the last edition of Beskna, Volume 22. And uh, I have to thank Kieran as well in that regard for, um, for editing it back and all sorts of stuff. So I'm very grateful uh, to him for that. And then I'm really happy to come and speak to you as well today about um, the hard concerns. I've brought a few as well along uh, with me. But before I get in just to... Um, I suppose just outlining what I do want to do today. I just want to start with this slide here. Um, the slides are a bit small, but anyway, you, you get the idea. So I just want to give you this background as to how I came to the Hardening Stems uh, first day. And that was back in the 1990s, uh, when I was looking at food and all sorts of stuff, uh, but in the early medieval period. And on a trip to the Ulster Folk and Transport Museum, now the Ulster Folk Museum, uh, in, near Hollywood in Belfast, um, I was in the visitor centre there, and on one of their walls, which kind of uh, spread between two storeys uh, of the building itself, uh, the wall was covered in these really strange objects here, not unlike what you see on the screen now. And I suppose they kind of, um, I have to say, just on an emotional level, they kind of affected me. Uh, quite a lot because, first of all, I didn't know what they were, and secondly, just very, I suppose, in a very kind of, um, uh, a, a very, very kind of human way, I thought these were absolutely beautiful objects, um, and they were beautiful because of uh, two reasons, I think. First, well, three reasons, I suppose. First of all, um, because they were kind of handcrafted things. Um, and also, I didn't know what they were, so there was an intrigue about them. Um, and they were inconsistent, as you can see. They're all different styles and shapes. Um, and that inconsistency was also, I suppose, spread over to the fact that there was a big degree of imperfection about a lot of them. And I liked that. And I found out what they were at that point, and um, they were a, a utensil used for in, in, in the, the process of making oat cakes, and I'll explain it all now in a minute. But that also, I suppose, was interesting to me because I had uh, been looking at food in early medieval Ireland where oat cakes were a staple of the diet. You know, they were a staple part of the diet. Not so much wheat and bread, which had sort of luxury uh, hierarchical status, uh, but oats and oat and breads were the breads of every day. 
and they were ubiquitous. And I had never uh, read about um, the implements associated with their baking in the early Irish sources. They don't talk about them there. They talk about the griddle and the baking boards and the griddle slice and so on. But there was no reference to anything like this. So I thought that was fascinating as well because I had not heard about these things for something that was everyday, mainstream, ubiquitous. Um, and then, of course, you know, uh, it was apparent that there was a geographic location, a regional association with the making of oatcakes at this point, because these would be 18th century, 19th century examples. Um, so there is a regional association with the oatcake at that point in time. So, uh, yeah, I got fascinated by them, and um, I, I thought they were just beautiful. And I find them very um, affecting, I have to say. You'll see some of the examples in closer detail now later on. So then what I did was, over the years, I suppose I was putting things together, and it finally all came together for Chiron's publication. And what I wanted to do, I suppose, was, and I have a lot of slides, uh, but there's text in some of them, not in all of them. I don't want to read text slides to you. So I'm going to just uh, paraphrase wh wh what, I, what, I, what the slides say. But what I wanted to do, I suppose, was look at, um, I suppose, the, 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 the physicality of the oak cake, for, of the oak cake stands in the first place, and link them up with the making of uh, oak cakes, oat and bread, which is kind of a misnomer, and I'll explain that as well later on. And then I wanted to see uh, how I might go about kind of learning more about these. And I thought they'd be a very good kind of um, case study of taking this kind of interdisciplinary approach to looking at one utensil to tell a kind of a story of uh, bread and people's relationships with bread and their bread choices in Ireland, particularly in the post-famine period. Uh, so that's what I did. That's what I, that's what I did, and that's what the article in Basin is about. Now, the, the, the text here is very small. It was bigger on my... On my um, on my computer at home. But anyway, you can get a sense of it. But, um, so what I wanted to do then was to see how suitable this one utensil was to take all different approaches to putting the story of, of, of the life, I suppose, of the utensil together. Um, and you know, there's a lot of literature about kind of material culture, there's a lot of literature about things and so on. But I was particularly taken by uh, the British archaeologist Ian Holder's approach when he talks about everyday things. And this is one perspective, one way of looking at every, everyday things, which is perfect, a really good way, an accessible way to look at the hard thing stands. So he talks about the entanglement of humans and their things. And it's a very messy entanglement in many ways. So he talks about humans being dependent on things, things being dependent on other things, things depend on humans, and humans depend on other humans. So even if you took all of those and just case studied that hard thing stand, you have a fantastic insight into food ways, food culture, and people and their relationship with food, um, particularly through bread and bread choices. Uh, and the period I'm looking at is Ireland in the post famine period, up until about the 1930s, 40s, or 50s, depending on where we are in the country. Um, so I'm going to sort of intersperse the slides with all different examples of the hardening stands. And I'll tell you how I went about the story now in a second. So this one is an example uh, from the National uh, Museum of Ireland from County Fermanagh. Okay, you can see it there. Um, and this is what I did then, um, is I said I'd consider the artefact through things like the archives, folk accounts, uh, ethnographic interviews, particularly with one collector, uh, to see if they were, had a, a profile or a presence in image and photographs. And then I went looking at cookery books to see what they were saying about uh, oak cakes or not. Um, and then I said, well, a really good way to learn about them would be to actually use them and experiment with them and make oak cakes on them. So the oak cake there in this picture is my own um, because the, you know, the obsession then grew and um, is turned into me hoarding them and buying them and looking out for them. And where you see them uh, today is in uh, auction house uh, catalogues. They go for auction quite a lot. Uh, so there's particular auction houses in Ireland that would have, I suppose, a leaning towards vernacular objects, 
So anytime those auction catalogues come out, I have a look. And sometimes they have a whole collection of them, sometimes they have one or two and all sorts of stuff. The problem with those, however, for the most part, is that they're unprovenanced. There's no provenance there, so the story is, is cut short very much. Um, so anyway, here we go, just to add a bit of confusion to things. This is another one of my hardening stands, and they're actually here with us today. Um, and this was the first one I actually found and bought myself. And this one I found in, I suppose, what you call a kind of a bric-a-brac -a -bric shop in Ennis. That, the others are from Northern Ireland, actually. Um, so I found this one in Ennis um, in a, a bric-a-brac shop, and its leg is missing. The support stay is missing. You can see I have, I have it standing up there in a makeshift way with a stick. So the, the, the ones I'm looking at, there's different categories of them now, but the ones I'm looking at are these ones here. They're the freestanding open stands uh, of wrought iron. And they've all different names, depending on where you are. So in Ulster, you hear them called oat cake toasters, or hardening, hardened, hardened harn stands. Um, you, outside Ulster, they're also called bread irons, bread stands, or bread, bread sticks. And you can see all the Irish words that go with them there as well, all the different names. Uh, again, uh, because it's not straightforward, there's this whole kind of entanglement in this regard, and so there's no consistency across the board as to what they're called. Um, so there then. So what I did was, um, in terms of the study, I said to you I looked at it from various different perspectives. One of, one of, perspectives. One of them was looking at, I suppose, the museum collections. So I looked at two collections, uh, this is a part of one collection, and this is part of the collection belonging to the National Museum of Ireland. Okay, the most of them at this point in time are in uh, Castle Bar, in the stores in Castle Bar. But what they've done is they've taken out the finest examples of the wrought iron small stands from Castle Bar, and they're on display in Collins Barracks in Dublin. So this is their Dublin display, and these are the finest ones, really. We'll come back to the big one there in a minute. Um, so they're all in the stores, you can have a look at them there and you can see the sort of the acquisition and the detail card uh, that goes with them. Uh, there's a drawing of the stand, uh, where it's come from, its location, and any other detail in terms of the acquisition detail. And then the physicality of the stand is recorded as well. Okay, that's the norm. Uh, so there's one there from, um, uh, I, I can't see it, I know it's, it's too small. And then the other collection I did look at as well, you saw it already in the first slide, was in, I should say as well, um, the National Museum of Ireland have different types of stands. These, ones, these types of stands, they have in the 30s, that kind of number, that's the volume they have. But then when you come along and you look at the stores in the Ulster Folk Museum, for example, like the slide, the first or second slide I showed you, they have the largest collection in Ireland of this type of, of, of stand, and their collection is kind of around 80, that kind of number. Most of them are in the stores, others are in the houses, and they use them if they are making bread for visitors, to, you know, tourists, and all sorts of stuff. Um, the, the Ulster Folk Museum collection, they also have a partner kind of a source of material to look at them, and I suppose these would be kind of like the National Folklore Collection, the Douglas Collection, in Northern Ireland, and there's three really rich sources there. One of them is their school's collection from the 1950s. Uh, the other source written information on accounts, folk accounts, would be from the collector's books or notebooks. You can see some, these are uh, the box from Antrim, the collector's books. And the book in the centre is the one from Robert Montgomery. And he's collecting material in June 1961. That was published in 1962. And you can see here his really detailed drawing of a stand from County Tyrone. I'll come back to that later on. And you can see here, it's, if you can see in the detail, it's Northern Ireland. It's called a Hardman stand. Okay, and the, the, the detail actually in this um, collector's book is quite extraordinary in his drawings and his detail and so on, not just for uh, a hardening stands, but for all sorts of things. It's a wonderful uh, journal that you can see there. And this is a close-up of, of, um, of his drawing uh, from the County Tyrone uh, stand. Uh, the other thing that I did look at as well was, was to try and see if they were represented in photographs and images. They don't appear that often, 
And this is one that uh, you can see uh, from the Green Collection, again from um, a Northern Ireland location. And just to give you a greater uh, appreciation of the image there, uh, you can see here um, some of the kind of the setup of make, making the oat cakes. Uh, the griddle is hanging over the open fire, which in this instance looks to be turf to me at ground level. Uh, so you have the griddle with the oat cake and the oat cake is, is, is heating up and is, is, is sort of, uh, what you might say, roasting would be the technical term, uh, but it's baking, I suppose, to some extent. And then, interestingly, what you see here is a different type of stand, and I'll come back to that in a minute, and this is a, a metal fender. So what they have instead of the stand is they have this almost hinged fender, uh, which they can place in front of the open fire and they're holding and resting against it uh, four pieces of the oat cake, and, oh, three pieces of the oat cake, and the oat cake here is cut into four quarters, which they call farrows. Even if it's cut into eight, they're still called farrows. The other collection I looked at in terms of the physicality was um, this collection, uh, which you kind of saw on my opening slide. And this was an extraordinary story, because this... Um, this is a food producer I actually know, his, his name, here he is, is Mark Jenkinson. Mark doesn't mind that I'm showing you uh, his picture, uh, he knows all about it. Um, so Mark is a food producer, he's actually um, a cider producer from Slane in County Meath. And he produces, well his company is called Mill Cider and he produces an artisan, if you like, a cider from a very particular variety of apples called Cockagee. They're a heritage variety. So it's really lovely cider. But anyway, uh, what he also does and has been doing for years and years and years is he's going to auctions and auction houses and he's buying up lots of sort of vernacular furniture. He has extraordinary things like canopy beds and all sorts of things. He has loads and loads of vernacular chairs. And then I discovered that he has a huge collection of hardening stands. It's quite extraordinary. And he has them all hanging um, in a shed. Right? I think he is 28, if, if I remember correctly counting them. The one he has his hand on there, he's very proud of, because he paid a lot of money for that, uh, with the idea that it would, uh, it would increase in value as time went on. Um, his collection is really interesting, and we'll have a look at some of them there now in a minute as well. Uh, I just thought I'd laugh as well, because he also has a collection of Hoovers, which is <laughs> off shot. Um, and then I told you about my own ones, um, there and that's one of them uh, and I love that because it's all wrong you can see you know there's, there's no it's the, the degree of imperfection is so endearing I think <laughs> um, now what I didn't uh, I, I also looked at cookery books and I'll come back to those in a minute and this really nice image is from oh, it's a bit blacked out there now for you but anyway this uh, really nice image is uh, from a food writer, uh, she's kind of disappeared really from public view now at the moment, called Claire Connery, who wrote a book called In a Country Kitchen. And a lot of the photographs were taken in the Ulster Folk Park. And what they did was, they took out of the stores the fender and they set up the... She's made a really excellent oat cake there, as you can see, on the griddle. And they set up the scene to photograph it for her cookery book, which is really rich in lovely illustrations. Uh, that I didn't look at fenders, so I'm going to tell you what I didn't do now, is I didn't look at the fenders, which is the one that you're looking at now, either metal or wooden ones. This is a wooden fender from the stores in the Ulster Folk Park as well. Um, so this is just a wooden example of the metal one. And I also didn't look at the oat cake stands that were the toasters that were also attached to grates, like this one. Uh, I didn't do that, um, and this one here. And that's really interesting. I didn't look at those, and I, I really do want to come back and, and, and see what I, what I can find out about those. That's really interesting because it reminds me of this. And this is the cover of um, Alexandra Fenton's fantastic book called The Food of the Scots. And um, what you can see there inside the book is he has uh, a picture of his mother, uh, Annie Fenton, making oat cakes in Scotland. And uh, what you can see um, from the book cover, but also one of the inside plates, 
is that they have, the slides aren't great, but what they've done here is they've made a kind of a great slot in front of the coals so that she can slide the oat cake off the griddle and stand it vertically in front of the coals so it's getting toasted. And that's really interesting because uh, even though you have the transition in uh, cooking methods from the open fire to the range system, they don't give up cooking the oat cakes. They don't put them in the oven. What they do is they adjust what they have to continue practice. So that doesn't seem to be happening in Ireland, but the greats in the Ulster Folk Museum are interesting to consider in that regard. Uh, but this is a Scottish um, example of that. Now, with all of that, and with all the collections and all sorts of stuff, and the folk accounts, uh, the, the, the physical objects in the museums, the private collections, the auction houses, and all sorts of stuff, and I suppose this is what really intrigued me, was that there was no really dedicated study about oat cakes or oat cake toasters, even the two of them together or separately. So if you look at uh, what has been written about them, so if you look at, for example, Irish folk plays, Eston Evans, here he is, and there's his, his page. What he does is he does a really effective illustration of the evolution of the stand from um, a really carefully selected piece of a branch of a tree, that's a tripod, going on to number two, whereby they have inserted a stay or a leg, and then they're going on to make it uh, in a more refined way in this arched wooden stand, and then to the metal ones, Number six there is, a, is a, a stone one, which seems to be associated with Ulster for the most part. Um, a rectangular one, number seven, and then the wooden fenders that we've seen already from, from the north. And he then writes a paragraph or two, and that's all. The, the other person who did write um, much more about them was Clodagh Doyle, who's uh, uh, one of the keepers in, in the, uh, the museum in Castle Bar. And she wrote a chapter on the, on the toasting stands whatever you want to call, call them, for her master's thesis, which she completed with the Department of Folklore and Ethnology here in UCC. Uh, and there she is, because we met in Dublin to have a look at the Dublin stands. Okay. So, um, so I suppose Clodagh, up to now, was, was the person who wrote most about them. But again, it was a short chapter. And it wasn't looking at the sort of distribution or the other sort of ways and perspectives that you could look at the stands. And particularly looking at the, rela the relationship between the stand, the other hearth utensils, and the actual making of the oat cakes themselves. And that, I, I, again, I suppose I go back to my point that because of the ubiquity of the oat cakes, this was really a sort of an omission, I suppose. Nobody writing about it. Um, and this is just a, a photograph of oat cakes, as you can see, just to give you an idea. But I have to be honest, these aren't my own. These are from Tesco. Okay? <laughs> so these are Tesco's little ones that they, that they sell as hard oat cakes and things like that. Um, and again, if you look at the history of the oat cakes in Ireland, like it goes through time, right? And I won't go through the history of it now. But if you look at the, the, the earliest sources from the early medieval period, oat cakes are omnipresent. And they seem to continue on as the main carbohydrate for, for, for Ireland. Then they're interrupted with the introduction of the potato as a substitute or a move over carbohydrate. And even when you look at like, accounts like Arthur Young in the late 18th century, the oat cakes are still spread around the country. You know, you can map his descriptions of them. But then what seems to happen is that uh, you get a contraction and you get a falling away from practice, I suppose, the practice of, of, of making oat cakes, particularly as the potato was gaining ground amongst the rural poor at the end of the 18th century and certainly into the opening decades of the 19th century. The, the, the two maps there are from Austin Burke's I had the visitation of God, it's talked about the family and all sorts of stuff. And I looked at Austin Burke and also the work of Leslie Clarkson and Margaret Crawford, uh, both uh, retired now from Queen's um, University in, in Belfast. These are the two authors of uh, Feast and Famine, one of the, one of, I suppose, still is one of, one of the most important publications for the history of food uh, from the early modern period up to the, the early 20th century. And I looked at what they were saying in terms of oat cakes and what they did both of them, uh, in terms of their distribution maps and all sorts of stuff, was, was they looked at the poor law inquiry reports, which are absolutely fascinating, looking at food, a selective look at food because it's the rural poor and so on. And what, what you can see here is that you have uh, still a kind of a retention of a high uh, consumption of oats in these areas here. Um, 
and a kind of a lesser consumption in other parts of Ireland. Okay, I, I, these are problematic as well because when you talk about the consumption of oatmeal, you have to think about well, how is it being consumed, right? So there's all different ways that you can consume it. But I think what these maps represent would be, if you're more precise about it, is a continuation of consumption and production and consumption, those two big aspects of looking at food and people's relationship with it, in the northern counties, over into, up into the northwest, into Donegal, and down into parts of uh, the west coast as well. So I was kind of guided by that, I suppose, and then I went away and I looked at all the different uh, sources that I, I, um, that, I, that I spoke to you about already. Um, and yeah, so I won't go through that slide now because we'd be only reading it out. So I had a look at the, the collections. I put this one in because I, it's unprovenanced. There's no provenance for this. But it's one of the most beautiful kind of minimalist uh, stands from uh, the Irish collection from the National Museum of Ireland. Okay, and then just, I suppose, a few slides. Again, I'm not going to read them because you can come and look at them and it's easier to see what I'm trying to say by looking at them here themselves. But just to kind of get up close with the stands and what they're all about. The only ones I looked at were these ones, okay? Not the grates, not the fenders, or, 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 or not the wooden ones or the stone ones. There's only a handful of the stone ones anyway. They seem to have a connection maybe with a uh, Scottish influence. So these were the fellas I looked at, the ground level, open um, uh, stands that you can see here. And they, they, even though they're various in their um, design, I suppose, in their design features, they all have the same uh, three elements to them. So what they need is, um, maybe I should bring up an image of them now here. There's more, lo more loads of detail there about them uh, that I won't read out. Measurements and all kinds of stuff, right? Um, but they're all there. Um, and these kinds of things. Oh yes, I forgot to say this. This is kind of the breakdown of uh, the, uh, the National Museum of Ireland's collection from wood, wood and iron iron ones. And also, interestingly, for Donegal in particular, they have uh, tin and wire stands that were made by um, itinerant tinsmiths. So that's really great. The, you know, the same sort of structure, but a different material. And then the stone ones as well. So when you look at the stands, uh, what you have is that you have the open, the open back, I suppose, here, because I suppose I should just take this off and talk, talk to it as I have them. So what you have is you have three elements, there's only two in this one now because the, the stay is gone. So you have the back rest here, okay, so this is the lid or the shelf where you rest the okay, so it rests against this. And this one has to be open because if it's, if it's just a, a solid piece of iron, the okay will steam rather than dry, okay? So they need this, all of these uh, parts to the back to be open. So you have the shelf here, which will hold it, the, the open back, where it's resting upon the shelf. And then you have this uh, here, which connects it to the stay or the leg, which will, so there are a few there uh, resting. Uh, so the leg, the leg is really important uh, in this. Uh, so, so, you know, they, they have these three kind of design features, which is across all of the stands, right? So other ones here, this is an interesting one because the shelf is missing. The shelf always breaks off, actually. Uh, the, the, the shelf seems to be the weak point. And look, they've done a really crude, but kind of interesting uh, repair job to that one. And they've put the shelf back in. Um, here we go, and these are some others. And then when you come along and you see the ones here from Mark, his collection in Slane, his collection is really interesting because a lot of his stands have another feature to the stand, which I haven't spoken about yet. Um, and each of the, not the main one, you can see that has a lovely, uh, what they call a candy stick twisted leg to it at the back, and that's got this really fancy uh, bar which divides into two legs with a little curl, uh, the big one. But the others, the other one, two, three, four, certainly I can't think of the detail now, the one in the middle, but the other four have another feature to them and if you look at them, um, what they have is on the back stay, they have a hook coming out at various points along the back leg. And that hook is, tells you that it needs a partner because what they do is they're holding spits. So that's to hold a meat turning spit. Um, so that one, 
that one with the spits, it will need a partner to support the two spits between them. So you have a doubling up, it's dual function in that regard. You can make bread, you can also roast meat or fish, uh, if you like. Um, so you can see the different shapes here. This one is kind of like the, the one there on um, the left, is kind of an elongated horseshoe. There's a more rounded horseshoe the shape as well, beside it. And then you have the rounder ones there that you can see on the left-hand side as well. And interestingly, you have this one, which seems to have possibly somebody's initials have been worked into the stand. And here are two sort of rectangular ones, and you can see the spit hoops more clearly. Um, so that's sort of just a very kind of quick synopsis of the, the kind of the features of the stands themselves. For me, when I was working with the stands, um, what was most important in terms of uh, the functionality and the effect of baking of an oat cake was the design of the leg. Now this one here is that my stand here, the, first, the second one over there actually, and that leg is just straight onto the surface of the ground and that's not really great because what happens is that it tends to fall over and what's much better is um, not this one either, that's, a, that's mine but it's at home. Um, just some of the rivet details here on that one. This is the molten, it's just it, the, a, a kind of a molten um, uh, unity, I suppose, between the two parts and all sorts of stuff. Um, I'll, come back, I, I'll come back to the legs in a minute. Um, but, but from all of the stands, I suppose, then what I did was, was I picked out one that was particularly, um, was particularly well crafted. And uh, that one that I selected for looking at, in particular, kind of a close-up of that, was the one here that you see in Collins Barracks. It's on this permanent display, actually, in Collins Barracks. It's the one called the Carcomon Stand from County uh, Carlow. And that's really beautiful. It's absolutely wonderful just to see the level and the degree of finesse, finesse and craftsmanship with this stand. It's really beautiful. And here it is. Uh, you can see they're trying out all different designs, as you can see. This one as well, you can't really see it here now in this slide. Um, so what it has, it has the scroll or the ram's horns, curls. Um, it has uh, arrowheads at some points in the design. And it also has those finials that you can see in the lower half, the two finials that are upright in that regard. And it's really exquisite, I think. Um, that's just a close-up of it, as well as you can see. But the other thing about the uh, uh, Cargo Coman stand is that you can see the back leg has got the spit, uh, the spit holder's detail on it, which suggests that it was part of a pair. However, if you look at it, it doesn't have its shelf. The shelf isn't on it. So that kind of then leads to the idea, well, was this just a trial piece? Were they practising their skills? Um, to this high level of craftsmanship. And actually, I suppose, when you look at the diversity of shape and style and the imperfections, that's one of the things I suppose you can say about the stands, is that they're like tapestry samplers, except they're metal samplers. It's like possibly apprentice smiths trying out their skills uh, in these small little objects that are utilitarian and functional and can be sold on and whatever. Um, and these are skills then that they can apply to uh, bigger objects of construction, things like gates, railings, and balustrades. So this could be possibly one of those in that regard. I don't know. But anyway, it's there on its own. It seems to have a partner in its design features, but the partner is uh, not there anymore. And there you go. Um, and then after looking at all of those uh, physical stands, coming on to see the, um, the material in the... Uh, the folklore collections and all sorts of stuff, uh, sometimes you come across sort of descriptions of them which really overlap um, really well and they correlate and they speak to each other, like this, this one here from uh, Donegal, which is drawing the stand, giving the dimensions, which is spot on for the most part. However, and this was the interesting thing, it was the bread and the stand relationship, I suppose, was the thing that I, I, I really didn't get because if you look at you can kind of tell what's happening with the stands and the physicality of them themselves. But when you go to look at the folk accounts, the written accounts, they seem to be kind of missing a lot of detail. And they, they're missing a lot of detail in the, the actual process of making oat cakes. 
What do you do first? What do you do second? How do you get the bread onto the stand? Where is the stand relative to the fire and the flame? Who's working it? All those sorts of stuff. That's kind of missing in the detail. And if memory has been communicated in these accounts, sometimes the memory is faulty, uh, the memory might be second-hand, and they're trying to make sense themselves of a memory of an object from the accounts they're hearing, and a lot of detail is missed. Okay, so that, I won't go into all of that, because that's what all of that is saying. Um, but there are some accounts uh, from, I just picked out a few of them there, like they just sort of how outlined the accounts are. Uh, the one there uh, on the screen is from Donegal, uh, but the top one here, the people made oat bread by mixing it with very hot water and then rolling it out thinly with a rolling pin. Uh, the oat cake is placed on a bread iron in front of a fire until it's baked. Right? Now that's kind of a good account. Others are kind of missing big kind of steps in the process. And just to give you some idea of what kind of oat cakes are, it's not like making bread at all. And oat cake is a misnomer, oat bread is a, mis is a misnomer. What, what it's like really is like making um, what they would have called um, before the 19th, into the 19th century as well, would be hard tack, ship's biscuits, right? These fairly dry, coarse things uh, that lasted a long time, therefore you could take them on the ships with you, and actually you could take them on journeys. And that's the next part of the research, is actually looking at the oat cakes themselves because they're a big uh, food that people can take with them uh, on journeys, uh, and that leads to other things as well, um, a whole other kind of sto uh, stories and studies there. And a lot of them as well would routinely have been given to immigrants when they were going to America, right? Because they last forever. And that essentially is what the stand is doing, is that it's putting it in front. What you're doing really is you're mixed, this is, uh, um, this, these are my oat cakes, just don't mind the cutting out thing because that's for a different thing. But if you what you what you what you what you have really is you have ideally you have fine oatmeal which is ground fine, and you mix that with water, um, hot, lukewarm, whatever. Well, actually, it is important which one you use. Uh, you can also use buttermilk or skimmed milk or milk, and you need a fat component to bring the thing together, right? Either lard or butter. So what you have really is you get, a, you get a paste, essentially. So it's not dough like making soda bread or yeast leaven bread or a sourdough bread. It's not that at all. It's a paste. And it's very difficult to work with. It's very sticky and it's very temperamental and it keeps on breaking. So this is why when I was reading the folklore accounts, I was saying, well, now, how do they go from that to that? Because that won't work. You can't do that. So it needs to go, it needs to slip onto the gribble, possibly, to, 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 to dry it out a little bit, to give it mobility so you can slip it onto this. And essentially what they're doing is, all they're doing here in the whole process, it's a very archaic way, really fundamental way of working with ingredients. All they're doing really is mixing it up um, with the meal and, and a liquid component, and then they're trying to take the liquid back out of it again to give it longevity, to give it life, lifespan. So that's all they're doing. So these fellas here are just drying it out, but they also give it a bit of a toasty taste, depending on where you locate it with the fire and all sorts of stuff. So when I was looking at the accounts from uh, the folk collection, and um, this is just a small bit of, of kind of the organisation, I did try to look at, I was trying to make sense, are they giving the detail here? So then I was looking at what grade of oatmeal are, are they talking about? Are, are they processing the oatmeal in the mill? Or are they buying it? Or are they doing it at home? They're doing a combination of all these things. What other ingredients are going into it? What is the detail about the water? Because the temperature of the water does have an effect on the paste coming together. Are they rolling it? How thick is it? Because these will all have implications to how you use this and get the, your, 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 your paste from your board onto that. Um, and then are they letting the dough set so it comes together a little bit, dries out so you can actually work with it and slip it over? And this is what the oat cakes look like, apart from the lovely photographs in Claire Connery and, and, and so on. So these are my oat cakes in front of the open fire. And they've got that characteristic curl. They curl up characteristically at the edges. You might have seen some of the lovely um, uh, images I showed you of, uh, of making oat cakes. 
in front of the fire, and I, and I did include the really good examples of the photographs, but I have to fess up um, and show you this and this, because I told you the leg is really important. So when I was cooking the oat cakes, this is actually Mukwa's traditional farms. When I was cooking the oat cakes, um, and this is part of the thing as well, this kind of sense of embodiment and the physicality of them and how women actually um, mediated and uh, controlled themselves and their bodies around the fire, uh, because it's a very different type of cooking. Open hearth fire cooking is really, really very different, even your posture and so on and how you position yourself and because it's, it's hard work, you're stooped, you're bending and all sorts of stuff. And if you have an open fire and you have maybe satellite fires, you're going between all the different things, trying to manage different cooking procedures and all sorts of stuff. So you have to be very conscious of the physicality of yourself uh, with, the, with the open hearth. And of course, I wasn't that used. I, I have cooked over the open fire, but I wasn't that used to it. So what was happening when I was going around and all sorts of, I kept on. Um, bashing into them and knocking the stands down. And sure, every time the stand fell down, the, the, the cake broke, right? So it went into all of those pieces. But, like I said in the article, it all was not lost because the hens were delighted then if they got in. <laughs> um, they could pick up all of those things, uh, which was really good. So look, that was my cheating image of them, um, this, this per perfect oat cake. It was perfect at one point until I knocked the whole thing down. <laughs> but, and that's why I was saying the leg detail is really, really very important, which then suggests to me is there sort of connection between the smith and the woman working over the open fire and all sorts of stuff. Um, I think the detail and the knowledge of working with oat cakes is kind of lost for the most part. And the one person who did um, give it good detail was this great woman called Florence Irwin. Uh, she was food writer with the Northern Whig in Belfast newspaper in the early um, uh, 20th century. But she also was one of these itinerant cookery instructresses with the Department of Agriculture and Technical Instruction, whereby she went out into the rural areas to teach rural women how to cook. And a lot of the uh, recipes that she put together in this uh, 1930s publication called The Cooking Woman uh, were based on her experiences, so it's almost e ethnographic, I suppose, really, her experiences of getting recipes from uh, women in rural settings. And she gives, really, she's the best detail, really, of, um, in, in, in talking about the relationship between the, the, the physicality of putting the ingredients together, putting it onto the griddle, and then putting it onto the hardening stand. You can see here, her modern oat cakes are going into the oven, and they work, they, they're fine. They can just put it into the oven. She skipped out the part maybe where the ranges with the grates and all sorts of stuff, like we saw with Alexander Fenton's mother. So I suppose I won't go on now for too much longer, but just to, I suppose, like this, this for me was kind of the essence of it really, and uh, what was happening to the, the oat cakes after the famine, the post famine period, which of course has influenced um, the detail or the nature of the accounts in uh, both uh, Dilkas and the accounts from the Ulster, the Ulster Folk um, Museum archive accounts as well, which actually go up into the 1960s actually. So what's happening is that after the famine, uh, there's more food choices, okay? Food becomes cheaper, you have this, well some people call it the first period of globalization. I would see it as the second period of globalization where the food systems in Ireland change um, hugely and it's almost like this clash of tradition with modernity. And the oat cake loses out. So this illustration here is of, of a stand from County Mayo. By the 1930s, this is a museum piece. Okay, they're thinking about it in a museum context, even. Um, she says, look, this is a, an account. She's in Limerick, but the, the stand is from Mayo. And she says, this is in our little school museum. It's already put in somewhere. You know, so it's a remnant of the past devoid of its functionality and its utility. Um, and these were the two food, food systems, I suppose, coming together. I, I've taken this quotation here from Edward East. He's an American. Um, he, works with, he was working with genetics and, and corn and eugenics and all sorts of stuff. But this is interesting because he's talking about how the food system has changed in America by the early 20th century, where they're now thinking about the system whereby you've lost all sorts of... A tangible connection with how food is produced because 
no longer are uh, in Ireland the people working with the oat cakes and so on, no longer are they food producers, but they're food consumers. So they're operating in a very different world altogether. And you can see here it's summed up in this account from Montgomery's account, where he says, this is from County Tyrone. It's now given to the museum in, 19, in, the, in the early 1960s in, in Ulster. He says, there's no more use for these when the stoves and the ranges came in. And of course, what they lost out to was the products of globalization. Cheap wheat coming in from America and the Balkans, the results of science in the kitchen, making artificial chemical leavens, bicarbonate of soda, and of course the whole sort of uh, popularity of commodity culture, the industrialization of food in the second half of the 19th century. Uh, at home, you could see it in the domestic context in the production of soda bread. We think that's traditional. It's actually really not. Uh, it is the production of, it's, it's a product of modernity. And you can see here, they've made these lighter files now, made of white flour or brown flour, buttermilk, soda, to produce lovely fluffy bread. And how would you blame them? Which would you prefer? <laughs> and that the other thing, of course, they lost out to was uh, the rise in the baking industry, the upsurge in the number of bakers in Ireland in the second half of the 19th century, who are producing factory bread, uh, not soda bread or soda files, uh, with bicarbonate of soda, but bread that's made with baker's yeast, um, industrially produced yeast as a leavening agent. Sourdough is gone now at this point as well. Um, and this now was what they valued. This was the bread of value because it was the symbol of sophistication, modernity, going to the shop or buying it from the bread van or whatever, uh, instead of the oat cake, which really loses out. Um, and I suppose that's what came home to me was that one utensil, one bread uh, type was kind of summed up, gave you a fantastic all-round picture of tradition, modernity, displacement, continuation, and all sorts of stuff, really. Um, and also, I suppose, uh, it gave insight into, uh, I suppose, the value of looking at something from various different perspectives. For me, the, the big one, because it, it let me read the folk accounts uh, differently, um, was actually trying it out and experimenting with the stands to see how they worked or didn't work or what the problems were and then to see, you know, how that related to the folk accounts. Um, but I still have a big place in my heart for uh, the old cake stands and that's my favourite one because it's so wrong and so, um, so not right. Um, but, but just say thank you for coming along. I really enjoyed giving the talk and... Um, much better detail is in the is, is in the article in um, the last volume of Basement from, from 2022. So thank you everyone, thanks for coming along and uh, it's great to be here. For me, for me Margaret Regina, that kind of publicity you just cannot buy. <laughs> so, uh, no, it is a wonderful article uh, and I, I, I thoroughly enjoyed it and I'm delighted that you were able to come along today, Regina, and share some, some of your findings with us all. Delighted to, to be here. I was, I was just thinking, I'm sure there are other questions, but I was just thinking, when you were looking at the different examples and you've spoken about the, the timber ones, the, the wooden ones, the very early ones, when you move into the latter part of the 18th century, early 19th century with those examples, what are the kind of major changes that we see? I'm sure that Carrie Croman example was like the high point, maybe we'd say, but what are the changes that you were, you were witnessing in those periods? Yeah, and that was, I suppose, coming back to one of the big questions is like, well, somebody will look at them and they say, well, how old were they? Yeah. And, like, you know, you want to have the neat answer. Um, and I think the dating goes back to your question and what, and I, I, I was very, um, I suppose, very, very grateful as well to Colin Rain, who, who I, because I, I don't know about smelting and blacksmithing really, so I was talking to him about it. You can't date metal like iron, mm. you can't carbon date it, and it's very complicated to make a date, but um, what was happening at the end of the, the 18th century, now I know all of this, is that there was, there was uh, um, I suppose, a more sophistication attached to how iron was smelted, and they introduced this thing called the puddling system um, in 1784, that's in my head, and um, what happens is th there was the technology for smelting and how the iron was being smelted for wrought iron uh, became more sophisticated and that allowed them to produce wrought iron uh, in a larger scale. So the price came down. 
So then you, you might say that, well, this between the late 18th century into the 19th century, possibly. Um, I don't know if anyone is making them beyond, you know, the 1880s, that sort of stuff. Right, right. That's kind of the yeah. era of, yeah. of production and, mm. and use and all sorts of stuff before yeah. they, they fall from use at all. Yes, yes. So I think that technological advance um, spread, the kind of, it gave greater access to rock and iron mm. for all of the things that we think about now, like the gates and the railings and all sorts of stuff. Mm. Uh, so they, they come online, in, uh, you know, they're cheaper, so there's more, mm. than, more of them around. And then that possibly could have tied in with the blacksmithing activities. They said, look, this is, you know, a new revenue stream for us. We can, we can make money by if doing all of this work. Yeah. Why don't we get maybe, I don't know, I'm imagining this, why don't we get the young apprenticemiths to practice out on these stands, you know? Mm. Because the, you know, looking at that first slide from the Ulster Folk, Folk and Transport Museum, all of the designs and what they're doing, you know, they're, yeah, the, yeah. the creativity and the diversity yeah. is, is, is striking, really. Yeah. And some of them actually from Northern Ireland and the Rot Iron have different designs. I didn't include them there. Some of them have these lovely tree designs to them. Um, abstract tree now, obviously. But um, yeah, so maybe it was kind of just an experimental site for apprent apprentice smiths. I don't know, to yeah. practice their skills. Yeah, yeah, kind of. And test, then they test pieces are something I, like I think those ones there, those two which are from Northern Ireland the, with, the, with the bars. They're very plain and non-decorative. Mm. I think they're the most routine ones. Routine. If you wanted to hard and stand, the yes. slip would do those for you. Okay. But maybe if you had maybe the time and um, the inclination to practice, they're producing all of the other ones that yeah. we see. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I don't know. Amazing, that's amazing much of poverty. Yeah, yeah. 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 And yet there, there's this consistency at the same time as well. Oh yeah, they yeah. have to have yeah. the back and, and the, the shelf yeah. and the leg. Yeah. And the leg is, yeah. is the crucial it's part crucial for me. Part of it. Yeah. Because you, you have to think about the floor as well of the houses. Is it, um, is, it, is it slab and stone, or is it an earthen floor? Mm. Okay, you can. So that one there with the, with the, the flat leg, that's not really great. It keeps on falling down. You can't anchor it somewhere. The other one is like a fork. You can fork it into, into the earthen floor, yeah. or you can fork it between slabs. Yeah. You know, yeah, you get a yeah. better grip. Because yeah, yeah. uh, the big thing is you forget it's there, and you go walking around, and you knock yeah. into it, and yeah. then the whole thing is... <laughs> It's gone. <laughs> uh, very good, very good. I'm sure there are other questions. Uh, yeah, just here. Not only because of how beautiful they are, and that they make you look inside. Do we see a lot of evidence that you think repaired? Like that people are using the same one over and over again and returning to it and having it fixed because they like that one in particular? Uh, or do you think we have people yeah. like that? Yeah, and that's why some of the ones from the. Yeah, yeah you <laughs> can see the repairs, do you know? <laughs> And the repairs are either okay or they're really, they're really not okay. They're really bad. But I suppose that that depends on kind of I suppose how well off the people were, and uh, they are repairing them. I suppose is the first point, uh, which suggests continuity, you know, continuity mm. and using over and over again, and the need to have them so you repair them. And an attachment to the designer, presumably as well. Yeah. You know, people that, yeah, uh, that's right. Yeah. But like some of them, there, one of those shelves, the first one I showed. There was no kind of sense of the aesthetic about that, you know. They just, it was purely this, this kind Function. of piece of almost yeah. hammered yeah. metal that yeah. they attached yeah. on. And so the thing was up and running again, you know. <laughs> so you can't, yeah. like, you can't, um, you, ca you can't stand without the, without the shelf, without really. The shelf. Yeah, because yeah. the whole yeah. thing will yeah. collapse. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And the other thing I didn't talk about because I didn't have time is that if you didn't have these, there's a whole other kind of family <coughs> of substitute stands that they have as well that you hear about in the... In the in the accounts. Don't tell them about that. No, we need. Yeah. <laughs> so, oh yeah. Oh yes. Oh, uh, yes. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Only joking. Emma, you had a question there. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much, Regina. That was marvellous. Um, I noticed in the beginning of the slide about the introduction of potato and the introduction of the monoculture spread against one that the, the bias for the continuation of the use of both these seem to be uh, very much in the, the northeastern half of the island. Would the stance generally be associated with that region where they come in Munster at all or in the southwest? Or do you have any sense of I know you can't probably, the province is impossible yeah. to ascertain in a lot of cases, but yeah. is turned up more? Um, Austin Burke and Leslie uh, Clarkson and Margaret Crawford were saying the northeast um, and into parts of Munster, but actually the stands spread outside that. Yeah. And they do, there's a lot of them in Donegal. Oh, right, interesting. And there's, there's quite a lot as well in the counties of, um, there's some in Galway, Clare, Mayo, Sligo, Leitrim. 
Um, for Mana, Tyrone. Yeah. So there is that, but they're not. It's not as confined as Austin Burke and Leslie Clarkson were trying to suggest or yeah. seem to be suggesting. They are spreading out over into the the northwest and down onto the west coast. Right. right. Down there. But no, you don't see them down in Munster. That's mm -hmm. why when I went to find when I saw them first in in Belfast, I kind of went to thought, what are these? Mm -hmm. How do yeah. I how 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 do I not know about these? I know we have and they feature in a, in, in a story that um, that Audi Volinche told on Island Vort Tre Hine on Crown the Ron is mentioned in there. I just wonder what kind of a design that might have been or was it the more was it more wooden exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but surely there's a spread of flour then that's changed because the same cooking methods were being used, but we're doing potato bread, cars, potato bread where I come from was the, the spin off. And mm -hmm. to sew the bread, like my grandmother would always put pinhead oatmeal in, always loads of pinhead oatmeal. Oh, where, where was that, Kevin? My grandmother was in Offaly. Oh, and yeah. My, okay. And, yeah. And they would always put loads of pinhead oatmeal in the brown bread. Yeah. And, and it was cooked over an open fire when the, you know, that's past. The past. Yeah. yeah. And then the, the, the because the coals could go on top of it as well, so you could cook it evenly. Like that. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. So it was really only just one more step, and like it was flour must have been the availability of yeah. flour, because they had pinhead oatmeal, was still the big thing to have pinhead oatmeal in. Yeah. Because then you had, you know, your, your, your hens were being fed, you were yeah. being fed, porridge was in for the year, like so. Mm. Exactly. Not fed, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, you're right, because it will last all throughout the year. Yeah. So what they're doing is, uh, you then have to look at uh, the accounts of the cooking and the different yeah. types of dishes. Uh, so the north is particularly good for that. Mm -hmm. So what they're talking about in the north is that they're using it for making they're mixing it with potatoes and oats. They're making potato oat and cakes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They're making potato oats and apple cakes. Well, they're mix yeah. yeah, they're mixing it with the flour, like you say. But the thing as well is that it's like this, you know, the Ian Hodder thing about entanglements. These are all messy, do you know? There's no one way of working. Yeah. Um, there's also, and that's why trying to find, definitively find out the solution, for, you won't do that, yeah. because they're all doing different things. Mm -hmm. And they're calling them different, they're calling a griddle, a, a, a stand, and it's all confused. And you don't know where you are, but and because it's food and because it's 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 on an, on an individual basis, but also on a cultural basis, there's individual expression. So they're using they're use they're mixing wheat with um, oatmeal. It's stretching stocks as well, but they're also mixing wheat with with maize, which is a famine food. It's stretching stocks too. So you see all of these little different expressions of economy and taste, I suppose, and availability as well. Like, is it how often can I go to the shop? depending on what time I'm talking about. Where am I in the country? Like Donegal is a lot of them, you know? And Donegal seems to be the place where there's a pocket of continuity and they survive longer there. And then it's interesting because there is variation now in the second half of the 19th century, which is of course what changes traditional food big time for Ireland, you know? Um, so there is other things that they can buy, but in places maybe where the commercial sort of side of life is not as pronounced, there's vestiges of older traditions still survive. And then within that even, it's really interesting because you see, well, they're still making old cakes kind of every day, but then they're doing, if you have a special time, what do they do with them? And you can see accounts where they're adding in a little bit of spice. Caraway is the big one. So they make it a special occasion thing. You know, so it, it's all different. It, it, it's, uh, well, it, it's, it's, it's very various depending on uh, personal choice, depending mm. on location, and mm. depending on socio-economic standing, I suppose, mm. really, mm. do you know as to what's happening? Regina, yeah, I've got to meet him, August. We'll have to let you go, because we have a lot of more questions, I'm sure, but yeah. uh, you can have a word with Regina, I'm sure, on the way out. Go to meet him, Yes, Yes, Bula, more.